And we'll, we'll concentrate on the retirement part of Social Security, of course, but I want to very briefly talk about the other parts of the program. Because everybody thinks about Social Security, you know, as a retirement program, but uh, actually based on my experience of 33 years working there, I think the retirement benefits are the least important part of Social Security. They also pay survivor's benefits and disability benefits. And most people are aware, but most people don't know how important those benefits are. But the biggest reason they're more important than retirement benefits is actually human nature. Because we do look forward to retirement. We make plans for retirement, but we're not very good at making plans for becoming disabled or dying at a young age. But that happens far more often than you realize. Actually, one out of three workers, one out of three workers will either die or become so disabled they can't do any type of work at all before they reach retirement age. The great majority of those one out of three don't die before retirement age, which is the good news, but they become disabled before that age, which is much, much more expensive, which is the bad news. On those survivor's benefits, if a parent should die that's worked and paid into Social Security, they'll pay a check to each child up to age 18 or up to 19 if they're still unmarried and a full-time high school student. Also part of survivor's benefits is widow's benefits, but those tie in more with retirement, so I'll delay and talk about those in more detail in a few minutes. And then disability, in my opinion, the most important part of Social Security because uh, becoming disabled is the most expensive thing a person can do in their lifetime. For disability only, a person has to work recently. For retirement bene benefits, a person has to have worked for 40 credits, which is 10 years of work. It could have been a long time ago. They've got their 40 credits. They qualify for retirement benefits when they reach that age. But for disability only, a person has to have worked recently. And the basic rule is that a person has to have worked and paid into Social Security for five out of the 10 years before they became disabled. They become disabled at a young age, before age 31, it could be less work. And then there's a special disability program for people, for widows. As you'll hear in a little bit, they normally have to be 60 to widows or widowers to draw benefits on the deceased spouse record, but as early as age 50, if they're disabled. And disabled little children, if a child became disabled before age 22 and remains disabled and unmarried from that point, until one of the parents either dies or starts drawing Social Security, at that point they can receive a benefit on that parent's record as if, as if they were under age 18. But I think you probably came for retirement benefits. Now actually, when we're talking about Social Security, that term, retirement benefits, is not a general term that has a specific meaning. Retirement benefits at Social Security means the benefit we can receive based on our own work at a certain age, which is 62. So we have to be at least 62 to receive retirement benefits from Social Security. <clears throat> Excuse me. At 62, those benefits are reduced a little bit for each month we are younger than our full retirement age. As you can see on the chart, full retirement age has gradually gone up to age 67, back in 1983 is when this law was passed. And it was passed because we were living longer. As we started living longer, they raised full retirement age. But no matter what your full retirement age is, if you're retired when you turn 62, you can start drawing reduced benefits then. So 62 has not changed for reduced benefits. To give you an idea about why Congress did raise that full retirement age, a few years ago, back when I was still working at Social Security, I was in Baltimore at the headquarters for a meeting. The actuaries of Social Security came to speak us at this meeting. They told us that of the people born 1960 and later, who have 67 for their full retirement age, they think there's a good chance to live an average of close to 30 years after they start receiving Social Security retirement benefits. An average of close to 30 years. And for the last 12 years or so, the fastest growing part of the population by percentage has been the people over 100 years old. 
So anyway, that's why Congress did raise that for retirement age. But no matter what yours is, if you are retired when you turn 62, you can start reduced benefits then. The question is, should you? Well, of course, it's each individual's decision, but I give you the information you need to make an informed decision. Now, first of all, it's a month by month reduction if you take that benefit before your full retirement age. Each month you're closer to this age, you see on the screen here, that you wait to start your benefits, the check will be a little higher. So if you begin your benefits when you're 62 years and seven months old, your check would be a little higher for the rest of your life than it would be if you started the month before. So it's a month by month reduction. If you start exactly the month you turn 62, at that point you would receive between 70 and 75% of what you would have received had you waited until your full retirement age, the exact percentage you'd get if you start exactly the month you turn 62 depends on where you fall on this chart, what your full retirement age is. So if you are retired at 62, you can receive those checks, you have a decision. Should you take those reduced benefits? Should you pass them up and wait and draw your full benefit at your full retirement age. Well, if you are retired at 62, so you can draw those checks, you decide, no, I'm going to pass those checks up and wait to my full retirement age. By waiting, you would have a bigger check each month for the rest of your life, but you would have passed up all those checks you could have received in exchange for that higher monthly check. With that higher check you get by waiting, it would take you about 12 years receiving that higher check to recover the money you passed up by waiting. So in other words, you take the reduced benefit, you're ahead 12 years past your full retirement age. That's a break even point. Now I know 12 years sounds like a long time, but when you're making that decision, keep in mind that only about half as long as the average person starts today will draw those checks. It's a much different world. Think about it. When our grandparents were 70, they were really, really old at that age, weren't they? Now, when somebody dies in their 70s, we think they died young. It's a much different world. The reason it pays most people to wait as long as possible to start drawing those checks is because when people start living longer, insurance companies can just change their tables anytime they choose, which they've done. That's why life insurance costs less now than it used to. We're living longer. Social Security tables are based in law. It takes an act of Congress to change them, which they haven't really touched other than raising for retirement age a little bit. And we're living longer than they thought we were going to when they did that already. What that means is basically, Social Security started paying reduced benefits in 1958. So what that means is, it's basically the reduction for taking the benefit early is based on how long 65 year olds lived in 1958. We're living a lot longer now. That's why it pays most people to wait as long as possible to start those checks. But nobody's most people, we are who we are, so our decision to make. Now, people do ask me all the time, they say, when's the best time for me to start taking those checks? Wanting me to make that decision for them. <laughs> thought about this a whole lot. I can still only come up with one way to answer that question. And that is, Tell me the date you're going to die. Not <laughs> take those checks. That's, that's that's the only answer I've got for that. And my crystal ball doesn't work that well to, to make that kind of decision with somebody. But maybe you've got some kind of inside information. If you do have some inside information, and you know you like some people I used to visit back when I worked at Social Security, you might want to wait and take that full benefit at your full retirement age. Social Security is a special project every couple of years. In this project, they go out and visit all the people over 100 years old who are receiving Social Security benefits. You might not think that would be a very big project, but remember, it is the fastest growing part of the population. There's a purpose behind this project. It's a security audit. The reason they go see all the people over 100 in person is so they can verify 
that they are still alive, that they haven't died and somebody hid that fact and kept cashing their checks. They don't, they don't figure now. We don't tell them when we go figure them out. When we, they, they, the associate doesn't tell them that's why they're out there talking to them. But I found a lot of people out on their own <laughs> when we do this project. And I worked in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I used to help a lot of the local offices in that area when I worked for Social Security with that project because they needed help with it. There are so many people over 100. A few years ago, Social Security changed the project. They can no longer go visit all the people over 100 each time. There's way too many. So now when they go to that project, they just visit the ones they haven't seen yet. The ones who have turned 100 since the last time they did the project. Because in the Dallas Fort Worth area, just in this year alone, this calendar year alone, more than 800 people will turn 100. That doesn't count the ones already over 100 January 1st. That eight, that's 800 more turn 100 just in that area in this one year. Wow. And not only are there a lot more of them, they're a lot healthier group than they used to be. Of those 800 plus people that are turned 100, the DFW area this year, the great majority are not in a nursing home. Most of them still live out in the community. Quite a few of them still live in their own homes, all by themselves, taking care of themselves. And I really do mean taking care of themselves. I've seen a few of these people actually more in their lawns than 100 years old when I drove up to their house. Wow. wow. One year, I had to go first his job site to find him. He was still working at 100. Let me talk about one lady people always find amusing. I went to see her quite a, quite a few years ago. This is a long time back when I, was working, when I was working at Social Security Plus when they were missing all the people every time that were, were over 100. This lady was 103 years old when I went to see her. She lived in her own home all by herself on the west side of Fort Worth, which is an older part of town. Great shape physically, really sharp mentally. As we were talking to her that day, she got curious. She said, well, who's the oldest person you have on your list. We look, we said, well, the oldest person in this area is the lady right here in Fort Worth. It's 108 years old. Well, this 103 year old's reaction to that was 108. Wow, now that's old. <laughs> so if you're going to be like her or that 108 year old, you know, wait till you retirement, you money ahead. Or even wait longer. Once a person reaches this full retirement age, age on this chart here, there's no limit on their earnings. When somebody is younger than this age, there's a limit how much they can make from work without affecting their benefits. But once they reach their full retirement age, they can keep on working full time, we see their full benefits. But even then, some people don't take their checks in. Some people even wait till 70 to start those retirement benefits. Now, why would they do that? Because of something called delayed retirement credits. For each month from your full retirement age, age on this chart, until age 70, if you don't take a retirement benefit from Social Security, when you do take that check, they'll add something extra called a delayed retirement credit. It's added for each month you wait. Over 12 months, though, it totals 8%. So if you're for retirement at 66 and you don't take the benefits until 70, four years later, your check would be 32% higher for the rest of your life. 8% for each of those four years. But don't wait past 70, because the quit adding credits at 70. Also, those delayed retirement credits only apply to retirement benefits, which are benefits based on our own work. Delaying a spouse's or widow's benefit past that age would not increase those. Did not say the husband was the higher wage earner, he waited until 70. So he got those delayed retirement credits and he passed away first. The widow does get his higher benefit he got by waiting, but it wouldn't pay her to wait past her own full retirement to start taking that benefit. She gets the full amount she's due at her own full retirement age. So she also pays spouse's benefits. You can draw benefits on your spouse's record as early as age 62. You also have to not be entitled to more based on your own work. If your spouse is living, you have to take your own social security first. There's one exception we'll talk about in just a little bit. But in general, if your spouse is living, you always have to take your own social security first. So we're talking about spouse benefits. That means the wage earner is alive. So if you're filing on your living spouse's record, 
at that point, anything you, you can draw on their record is based on half of their unreduced full retirement age. So when your spouse is alive, anything you receive on their record is based on half. If your spouse is deceased, then any benefit you might draw on their record, they call widow's benefits. Once again, it could be widower's benefits. It's the same for men or women. Unlike a spousal benefit, it's based on half, a widow's widower's benefit is based on the full amount of the deceased husband's check if they're drawing Social Security when they died, or it's based on their full unreduced amount if they died for flavor junior benefits. Let's take a most common, like an example of the most common situation with widow's benefits. Let's say we have a husband and a wife both drawing Social Security. Say the husband's check is $2,000 a month, the wife's is $1,400. If he dies before her, if she's at her full retirement age or older, her check would go up to exactly what his was. In this example, her check would go up to $2,000 a month. If she was younger than her full retirement age when he died, her check could go up to that higher amount, his higher amount, once again reduced a little bit for each month she's younger than that age. Widows and widowers can start drawing benefits as early as age 60, a little C spouse record. Or as early as age 50, that widow or widower becomes disabled within seven years of the spouse's death. Now, widows and widowers have some options that do not apply if your spouse is living. As I mentioned before, if your spouse is living, you have to take your own Social Security first. That's a general rule. That doesn't apply to widows and widowers benefits. They can take whichever benefit they want whenever they choose, either their own or the widows. They can take one and switch to the other one. They're not required to take their own first. So let's say we have a widow. Let's say she, she's a widow. She worked herself, but her deceased husband made more money. So the widow's benefits are higher than her own retirement benefits. Let's say she retires when she's 62. At that point, she would have the option of taking her own lower benefit first, receive that until she reaches her full retirement age, and then switch over to unreduced widow's benefits for the rest of her life. Or vice versa, her own benefit was higher, take the widow's first, delay her own, her owner keep growing if she delayed it to late 70 with those delayed retirement credits. So if that doesn't apply to anybody listening here, if you are a widow or widower, haven't filed for benefits yet, you're unmarried, or if you did not marry your current spouse until you're at least 60, because then you can still get the widow's benefits, I strongly encourage you to contact Social Security and let them give you all your options in dollar figures and dates. They can tell you if you take the lower one first, you'll give them so much money per month now. But by doing that, you get so much more later when you switch to the higher one and give you all those options, dollar figures and dates. That's the only way to make an informed decision. Now, I mentioned that there was um, one exception to having to take your own benefit first if your spouse is living. It's called a restricted application for spousal benefits only. Restricted application for spousal benefits only. And this was a mistake in the law. It was never intended by Congress in the first place. It was an error in the law that nobody noticed for decades. Till about 20 years ago, somebody found this mistake. They publicized it, people started using it. It was legal, so it was fine. But since it was not intended by Congress, they did away with it five years ago, but they grandfathered some people in. So if you are 62 or older by the end of 2015, then listen up, you're grandfathered into the restricted application. What this allows people to do is to file for a lower spousal benefit and then delay and let those theirs keep growing. So, so you don't have to take your own first, in other words, like you do normally if your spouse is living. So if you're grandfathered in, then if you if you're 60 year old by the end of 2015, if you wait until your full retirement age to file for benefits, you have to do that too, which would be 66 for anybody grandfathered in. If you're grandfathered in, 
you wait till you're age 66 or older to file for benefits. And if your spouse is drawing their own benefits. So all three have to apply. You have to be 62 or older by the end of 2015. You have to wait till 66 or older to file for benefits. And your spouse has to be drawing their own benefits. If those apply, then you can say, I don't want to file for my own higher benefit. I'll take a lower benefit based on half of my spouse's record. Why would somebody take a lower benefit? Because by delaying their own, they can get that 8% a year delayed retirement credits, mm -hmm. wait until 70, which over their own maximized check. It's like free money. Let's take let's take an example. Could be the wife to work for either one. It says, but let's just say the husband reaching 66 right, right now. He's 66, has a file for his benefits. Let's say his own benefit at this point is $2,000 a month. Now, if he wanted to, he could receive that $2,000 no matter what. He's full retirement age. There's no limit on his earnings. He doesn't want to. He wants to wait till 70 to maximize that check. That's why wife has to be drawn her benefits. So he waited until 66. She's drawn her own benefits. He can say, I don't want to file for that $2,000. I don't want to file for my own higher benefit. I'll file that restricted application for spousal benefits on my wife's record. He receives a benefit equal to half of her full retirement age amount. Her check's the same. Her check's not affected. It's the same whether he does this or not. It's free money. He receives a benefit equal to half her full retirement age amount from 66 to 70. Then he switches over to his own. It's now 32% more. So instead of that $2,000 check he got out at 66, it's now $2,640 for the rest of his life. If she passes away first, his widow gets that $2,640 for the rest of her life. Those extra credits got by waiting until 70 go to the widow's benefit. So at 40 times, he didn't, he didn't file for his own benefit, filed for spousal only through that check while letting his go at 8% a year. Too good to be true, right? Never was intended by Congress. I compare it to an investment that guarantees you 8% return for the next four years plus income for the next four years every month. Too good to be true. Was never intended by Congress. But if you are 60 year old by the end of 2015 and haven't filed for your benefits yet, then check it out. Consider it seriously because I did some figuring. An average earning couple in their 60s who would each of the average lifespan, if they did this restricted application, they'd get about $100,000 more in Social Security than they'd get if they both went into a full retirement age in, in their lifetime. So it could be very lucrative if you are if you are grandfathered in. Do we know that Social Security will be there in the future? Uh, Social Security can't go away. There's no way. Uh, matter of fact, the recession we had 12 years ago and our current whatever that we are in right now, so it's one huge reason why Social Security can't go away because it's the largest source of income everywhere. Once again, let me use the Dallas-Fort Worth area because that's where I've worked most of my life in the Social Security area. In the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Social Security right now pays over a billion dollars a month in benefits. Pays over a billion dollars a month in benefits. That's more than the payrolls of the top 10 employers all put together. And there's a lot of big employers in DFW area, and that's more than the payroll of the top 10 all put together. And the most important thing about this billion dollars a month is almost every dollar of it gets spent. It gets spent. If you're 80 years old, John Sporsky check, you're no longer saving for retirement. You're spending that check because it's going to come next month, and next month, and next month. And so when the economy slows down for any reason, such as right now, that, that billion dollars a month getting spent in the DFW area is keeping a lot of those stores and restaurants open. Can you imagine how many more would have shut down in 2008, 2009, or this year, had that been a month not still getting be, be spent? So I, I tell people I wish that Social Security money was a different color, so everybody would see how much of their paycheck comes from Social Security, basically. Uh, so that people realize how much everybody depends on it. So for just economically, it can't go away. And fine, and just for the human cost, would be tremendous, because most people draw on Social Security, it's well over half their income. So the check didn't go out next month. Just in the DFW area, once again, there'd be another 250,000 people without any money to pay rent, pay their electric bill, buy food. Now, they wouldn't all become homeless because they'd move in with you, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but that's another huge reason why it can't go away. And, and it's not a huge problem. Uh, Social Security's got almost $3 trillion extra money in their trust funds right now. 
And if we were dying as, as young as we were thought, they thought we were going to as baby boomers, that'd be plenty. We're living longer than they thought. They need to make some adjustments. But it's not really, financially, it's not that huge a problem. Um, but there's no way it can go away. There's a, the, so many people's paychecks depend on that money getting spent, for one thing. Gotcha. Tom, what would you say the biggest mistake that people make with regards to Social Security? I really think the biggest mistake is they, they take it too soon. They don't realize how long they're going to live. Um, since pensions have disappeared for most people, I mean, we don't have pensions. For most people, this is our only guaranteed lifetime income, particularly only guaranteed lifetime income that keeps pace with inflation for the rest of our lives. And to me, it makes sense to maximize our only guaranteed lifetime income. If you got a, a couple, healthy couple in their 60s, there's a 50% chance one will live to be their mid 90s. Well, if you're going to live one or two, you're going to live to be 95. You probably have outlived your savings. That's a lot to ask of your savings to last that long. If you outlived your savings, it'd be nice to have a $3,000 check coming in instead of a $2,000 check coming in at that point. Or if you had that higher check coming in all that other time, you might not outlive your savings. So I think the biggest mistake in general is people take it too early. Now, as far as a couple is concerned, I kind of like the idea of the higher earning one, the one with a bigger check, waiting till. 70 if they can, if they can afford it, wait till 70 to take theirs. And the lower earning will just take it as early as possible. I see a lot of value in maximizing the highest check. I don't see a lot of value though in maximizing both checks because once the first one passes away, survivor's gonna draw that higher check no matter what. So, you know, if the husband's check is 3,000 a month, the wife's is 1,500, once one passes away, survivor's drawing 3,000 a month. So it would make sense for him to wait till 70, but I don't see why she should have waited any longer than possible than, than when she could draw her checks because why maximize both checks? So I do like the idea, particularly of the higher one to wait as long as possible. I wanna talk about COVID, Tom. How okay. has it affected people's ability to interact with the Social Security Administration? Well, of course, Social Security offices are not open because talk about a super spreader. I mean, the, 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 it's not unusual when times are normal for a big city office to have over a thousand people pass their doors every single day. They simply can't be open. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not possible. They're all working. They're working from home. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, I'm sure it's not as efficient as if they were all at their office. The 800 number was really overloaded before COVID. So you can imagine what it's like now. So if you do need to contact Social Security, if you need to call them, I'll give you, I'll give you a little hint here. What you want to do is talk to them, when everybody else isn't trying to call them. So the best time to call Social Security's 800 number is between 7 and 9 a.m. Tuesday through Friday. Don't even try on Monday if you can help it. The rest of the week between 7 and 9 a.m. is the very best time to try. I'm not going to say you won't be on hold then, but you'll be on hold for <laughs> a lot of time than you would try to call in the middle of the day. Uh, and, and also, you know, if you, get, you get called back, if you get called back from Social Security, doesn't look like a government number. It may not be because they're all working from home. So they're using their cell phones, you know. All right. Uh, regarding publications, so obviously you've been a great benefit for all these many years for the Social Security Administration, even now with all the work that you're doing. Is there a places for people to go and actually read um, at this, maybe at their leisure to learn more about Social Security? Well, Social Security's website is probably the best for that, actually. Uh, you've got to be very careful. Uh, Maybe it's about every subject, but I happen to know Social Security. There's so much misinformation about Social Security, so much misinformation out there. And so just like anything else, when you read online, you need to be very careful of your sources and make sure you read what you're reading is correct. And so I'm not saying you shouldn't read some, you know, what somebody else says about it, but you might want to verify that actually by going to Social Security's website when you do that. Um, you know, I, I used to ice kid groups because they'd ask me all this misinformation, questions about all this misinformation. I'd tell you, you know, Anything that your your friends, your neighbor, your coworkers told you about Social Security, unless they worked there, they told you wrong. <laughs> There's really not many exceptions of that. There's so much misinformation about the program. Mm -hmm.